In this video, we're going to be looking at um, atomic line spectra, or really getting to grips with how light interacts with atoms and how that exchange of energy happens um, between quantum, quanta of light, photons of light, and individual atoms. And one example of this is where um, high energy particles coming from the sun come streaming towards the Earth's atmosphere. They're steered by the Earth's magnetic field in the way you will learn about in A2 physics if you carry on with it. And um, as those particles come streaming in, very high energy particles come streaming into our atmosphere from the sun around the poles, they give energy to the atoms and lead to the atoms giving off light in turn and that's where we see this glow of the auroras from. By the end of this video um, you should be prepared to start having a look at the energy levels in electron volts exercise at the start of the Nature of Light problem booklet and also the energy on a photon exercise and to do this, you should be able to um, relate the energy changes that occur in an atom to the frequencies and wavelengths of light that would be given off. And we need to be able to do that mathematically and actually uh, calculate those frequencies. And the other thing we need to be able to do is explain why atoms um, emit very particular, very specific frequencies of light. Um, and to illustrate that second point, I've got this image here. And it's another image of the aurora, but it's particularly picking out two very distinct but common colours in the aurora, and it's a green and a red colour that we can see here. Both of these colours are being given off by oxygen, because oxygen has very specific energy levels in it and emits these very specific colours that we're seeing. So by the end of the session we'll be able to get to grips with explaining why that occurs. Lastly, one more aurora shot, because I couldn't uh, resist putting this one in as well. This is actually a photo of Jupiter, um, and so we're seeing here an aurora on Jupiter. And this is how the auroras form around the poles in this way. And again, that we'll wait for for later because that's about the interaction between magnetic fields and, um, and charged particles. We're really looking at the interaction between light and atoms here, so why these atoms are giving off these lights, these, these particular colours. And again, along the same um, vein, really, you may have seen this before, but this is actually metal salts being burnt in a Bunsen flame. So again, what you're seeing here is particular atoms, particular elements being given energy and then giving off very specific colours, very specific wavelengths of light. Okay, so a few basics that we need to make sure we're aware of as well. So first of all, we'll make sure we're clear on a, what a photon is. So if I grab a pencil tool, and a photon. So a photon is a quantum of light. And what we mean by that is that it's the smallest unit of light that you can have. So if you imagine a beam of light, what it's actually made up of is billions upon billions of tiny, tiny photons. And each one of these photons is the smallest indivisible packet of light that you can get. So you can't split it in half and have two photons instead. It's, it's a unified whole. And one very important equation we need to know when we're thinking about photons is that we can relate the energy in a photon to the, its frequency by the equation E equals HF, where E is the energy of the photon in joules, H is Planck's constant, and F is the frequency of the light, and remember the units there are hertz. And since H is a constant, we can also say that the energy in a photon of light is proportional to the frequency. If we, double the, if we have one photon which has got double the frequency of another, it will have double the energy. We'll also need to remember the wave equation, because sometimes we're going to be being asked for wavelengths rather than frequency, so we need to be able to relate the energy of a photon also to its wavelength. So remember, the wave equation, uh, V equals frequency times wavelength. Wave speed equals frequency times wavelength. Or in the case of uh, a photon, seeing as it's light, it's always going to travel at the same speed. So C, the speed of light, is frequency times wavelength. Remember, if you need to look up Planck's constant or the speed of light, they're on the data and formula sheet. Uh, another thing we can note here is that if we substitute for frequency in the E equals HF equation, we end up instead with E equals HC upon lambda, seeing as frequency is C over lambda. So we replace frequency in the equation here with C over lambda, so HC over lambda. And again, we've got h and c on top of the right-hand side of this equation. These are both constant. Speed of light is fixed. It's a constant. Planck's constant. Definitely a constant. So we can also say the energy in a photon 
inversely proportional to its wavelength. So if we have one photon three times the wavelength of another, its energy will be a third. So longer wavelengths, lower energy. Shorter wavelengths, higher energy. But it's the inverse with frequency. Higher frequencies, higher energy. Lower frequencies, lower energy. One other thing we're going to need to be clear on is because we're talking about tiny, tiny amounts of energy when it's individual photons and individual atoms, the joule isn't much use to us as a unit quite often. So we're going to need to get used to using a unit of energy called the electron volt. So if you remember your definition for a volt or potential difference, it's work done or energy transferred per unit of charge joules per coulomb. So, to calculate work done we can rearrange that to work done or energy transferred is volts times charge. So an electron volt is actually defined as the work done on an electron when it's put through a potential difference of one volt. So the work done on an electron when it's put through a potential of one volt. So one volt times the charge, or charge on electron, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, again that's on the formula sheet, just gives you that the electron volt, work done on one electron through one volt, is simply the same as the charge on an electron, but in joules, so 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. One thing we need to make sure we're clear on as well is, that we understand about what an atom is. So obviously all matter made up of um, atoms and if we think about an atom you've probably learnt about it having a nucleus made out of protons and neutrons in the middle um, and that's obviously positively charged and then the electrons orbit around that. Although that's a picture we'll learn there's other ways of looking at it as well. So. If we take an atom with two electrons, we may have learned about shells as well, and so we get two electrons in the first shell, and then if it's a larger atom with more electrons on it, it may have some atoms in another shell. And obviously going up to larger and larger atoms, we have more and more electrons and shells on them. That's a picture we need to do away with for now. Um, we're going to look at a very different picture of the atom, which was developed by a man called Niels Bohr. He was a quantum physicist and made um, a lot of big contributions to our understanding of the quantum nature of the atom, and particularly the way that the energy levels in the atom, or the way that the atom could change energy levels, was quantized, was separated into discrete levels. And so here we have a very different picture of the structure of an atom. Now, one thing that's really, really important to point out is these energy levels that we can see, so energy level 1 just here, energy level 2 just here, and not the same thing as the shells that we saw on the previous slide. This is just a way of representing the way that the electrons in the atom can change their energy state. But that is a different thing between shells. They're not jumping between different shells, they're jumping between different energy levels. And that's the term we need to make sure we're sticking to. So these are electron energy levels, they're not shells. Okay, so if we look at this, we can see We've got six different energy levels in our hydrogen atom. This bottom one down here, which I called energy level one just now, is referred to as the ground state. This is where hydrogen, if nothing's giving it energy, if it's just sat around on its own, nothing giving energy to it, then it'll sit in its ground state, its lowest energy level. The highest energy level, number six up here, is actually when you've given the atom, or when the atom's been given enough energy for the electron to actually leave the atom. And that's a process known as ionisation. When something takes an atom, an electron away from an atom, that's ionisation. So what this energy level number six up here is actually showing us is where we would have to, how much energy we'd have to get the atom up to. From its ground state, it would have to go all the way up to here, and then that would cause the atom to become ionised, to actually lose, lose an electron. So, let's say something's come along, it's given this atom energy in some way. So, the way we can think about that is if it's sat in its ground state to start off with, down there quite happily, 
something excites the atom, something gives it energy. And we can use that term as a technical term. When we're giving an atom energy, we can refer to it being excited. So let's say something gives it enough energy, not enough energy to ionise it, to remove the electron, but to take it up from energy level 1 to energy level 3. So I've drawn an arrow here to show that transition, moving up from energy level 1 to 3. The numbers on the left let us see how big that energy gap is. So it's gone up from an energy level of minus 13.6 electron volts to an energy level of minus 1.51. So you might be wondering at this point why these energies are negative. Well, an electron in the atom is in a lower energy state. So if we call an electron separate from the atom zero energy, then as it actually goes into the atom and into its ground state, it's actually going to a lower energy state. So we call ionisation zero, and that'll be a negative energy. But we're always concerned between the difference between these two numbers, how much difference there is between these two energy levels, because that tells us how far, the, um, how much energy is required to move the electron between energy levels. So our atom's now excited and is sitting at energy level E3 at some point it's going to release the energy back out. And so what happens is the atom drops back down to a lower energy level. And there's two options available here. It could drop back down to level 2, in, or it could drop all the way back down to level 1. But let's just look at it dropping back down to level 2 first of all. So hopefully you're all aware of the principle of conservation of energy. This electron, this atom, has now lost energy. Well, that energy's got to go somewhere. And what actually happens is the electron loses energy and produces a photon of light. So I'm going to represent that as a little wiggly wave. So there's our photon of light goes whizzing off out of the atom. And that photon of light has an energy E equals HF. Remember, we saw that earlier on. Well, conservation of energy again. The energy that that photon's taken away from this atom must be equal to the energy it's lost. So this... HF that we've got here must be diff equal to the difference between the two energy levels. So we can say HF is equal to, well it's gone from E3 down to E2, so it's E3 minus E2 to find the difference between the two. So E3 <coughs> minus 1.51 minus E2, well minus a negative number, so plus 3 0.39. And if we plug it into your calculator, then you should come up with 1.88 electron volts. And then we'll move on to the next slide. So we've established that HF is equal to 1.88 electron volts. So we're going to need to convert that to joules. We're going to need to go into base units before we do any more calculations. So Remember, 1 electron volt, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So we multiply 1.88 by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, sorry, and we end up with an energy of each photon being 3.01 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. To get okay, and that's and that so free you to get away ready to use energy to hand energy to the way in electron volts, convert every two or three by one problem with the C-Battle Z plan. 3.01 times 10 to the minus 19, the energy of each photon, divided by Planck's constant, remember from the formula sheet, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. And that gives us a final frequency of um, 4.53 times 10 to the 14 hertz. 453 times 10 to the 12 hertz, so 453 terahertz. So... You may recall earlier on I mentioned the fact that sometimes it may be that we're not actually being asked for um, wave, uh, frequency, we may be being asked for wavelength instead. So don't forget that HF we had at the start is the energy of our photon from that change in energy level. So we can just put the energy equal to HC upon lambda. Now remember that energy's got to be in joules, but if you rearrange that, multiply through by lambda, um, the lambda gets multiplied through, comes up to the top, so we get lambda on the left-hand side, we divide through by the energy, again that's going to move down to the bottom of the right hand side of the equation. So if we want to get the wavelength, we end up with the rearrangement that E equals HC, uh, sorry, lambda, the wavelength equals HC upon E. And you plug your numbers in, making sure you've also, you've still done that conversion of energy from electron volts into joules first.
Okay, so we've covered quite a lot of content. So before we go on to the last part, um, which is actually going to be looking at how we explain why there's particular different colours and frequencies produced by different elements, I'd suggest at this stage it's probably worth going to the Nature of Light booklet on Moodle and going to page two, which is the energy levels in EV exercise. Um, what this is going to let you do is practice making sure you're doing your conversions between electron volts and joules correctly and then making sure you can get from those changes in energy levels to the wavelength of photons as well. So I would go away, have a look at that exercise for a few minutes and then we'll come on to actually explaining the uh, emission spectra, so these different colours and these different frequencies that are given off. So if we look at the light given off by a particular element when it's being excited, when it's being given energy, we see these very particular wavelengths of light being given off and you can see there's two different line spectra here. So one element here and one element here and I'm afraid I didn't take a note of what elements these are but what we can actually see here is where we see a line on the spectrum that's photons of a very specific energy, so a very specific frequency. And what we're seeing is each of these lines equates to one of the possible jumps between energy levels. So if we were to just draw a few energy levels well, there's one big jump that could happen there. So that would be associated with a large amount of energy being emitted, a high frequency, long, uh, short wavelength uh, photon being emitted. So possibly for this element that could be up in the long, or, uh, sorry, shorter wavelength section of the spectrum up in the violet here. Whereas if we look at the small energy gaps, the small jumps that are possible, well that releases less energy. And so the amount of energy that's being released here is more likely to, represent, uh, to correspond to one of our emission lines further down the spectrum, so towards the longer wavelengths and the lower frequencies. So if you're asked to explain why um, atoms or electrons, particular elements, can give off these specific line spectra, the key points you'll have to cover are, so the first point you need to make is that the atom is gaining energy somehow and the electron is moving to the higher energy level. So going back to our diagram, that's that process where we just move up to a higher energy level. And it may be one step, it may be several steps up. And that could come from heating, it could come from collisions with other atoms. Um, it could be that a current is being passed through a gas and electrons are giving energy to the atoms in that gas. So there's a number of different ways that that can happen. It can also happen, as we'll see in a moment, by the atom absorbing a photon too. So the next step is that once the atoms become excited, once the electrons moved up to a higher energy level, then the electron will move back down to a lower energy level. And it will do that by emitting a photon of energy E equals HF. The third point is that the energy levels in the atom are fixed. We saw earlier on the energy levels in the hydrogen atom. They're the same for every single hydrogen atom. So we have these fixed discrete, separate from each other energy levels. So, for example, if we have um, an electron in this energy level up here, it can jump all the way down to this energy level. But that's a fixed level. It can't jump and not end up on another energy level. So what we say is the, the energy levels are fixed, so only certain energy changes are possible. And then the last step in the explanation is to say that because there's only certain energy levels and the energy comes from fall between the energy levels, we only get certain energies and therefore frequencies of photon that are being emitted. And to support that last statement, we should give the equation E equals HF and define the terms. So I mentioned that atoms also um, can absorb specific frequencies of light, or they can take the energy from a photon. So here this diagram at the top is showing that process. We have an individual photon of light coming in, so a single photon comes along, always a single photon giving its energy to a single electron. Um, so a single photon comes along, the electron takes the energy and that puts it up to a high, higher energy level. Um, ignore the diagram with the orbits they've got there, remember we represent that by the photon coming along and moving the electron up to a higher energy level. So the, here we have a photon being absorbed rather than emitted. So if we look at the top half of this bottom diagram, this shows us the emission spectra of hydrogen gas. So we see very particular frequencies corresponding to the different gaps between the energy levels in the atom. The atom will absorb photons of exactly the same energy as it emits because the process is just the same, but in reverse. So 
because there's specific energy jumps that can be made which give rise to specific frequency photons being given off, we see the same in reverse. There are certain energy increases which can happen which correspond to photons of specific energies and so frequencies being absorbed by the atom. So what I'd suggest you have a go at is going back to the previous slide and trying to rewrite the explanation points I had there to explain why we get an absorption spectrum. So just have a go at modifying that explanation. So rather than explaining why elements have very specific emission spectra, you explain instead why they have very specific uh, absorption spectra, why they absorb very specific frequencies of light. If you pause here, you can have a go at that. Um, and then when you go on to the next slide, in there, which will happen automatically in a couple of seconds, that's contain the uh, correct explanation according to the exam mark schemes anyway. Okay, so here's my explanation of why um, elements exhibit absorption spectra, these line spectra where you see very specific frequencies being absorbed. So earlier we were saying that the atom gained energy and the energy moved to a higher electron, uh, a higher energy level. Now we need to be specific. It's a photon being absorbed by the uh, atom, by the electron. So the electron gains energy by absorbing a photon of energy equals hf. Remember to bring that equation in to aid your explanation and moves to a higher energy level. So that's our jump up to a higher energy level by absorbing a photon. We make the same point that we made earlier on. The energy levels are fixed, so only certain energy changes are possible. There's only a certain size jumps that could be made between energy levels, so only certain energy levels are possible. And then our last point here just needs very slight adjustment. So only certain energies and frequencies of photons will be absorbed. We've just changed emitted for absorbed. And there you go. So you should now hopefully be ready to tackle both doing some calculations with um, uh, atomic energy levels and also being able to explain why absorption and emission spectra exist. If you go to the Nature of Light section on Moodle, you'll be able to see there's a fair number of um, simulations, Java applets mainly, relating to this. The models of the hydrogen atom is very good. If you make sure you're looking at the Bohr model, the energy levels model, which you select on the left-hand side of it, it will help you visualise the process of photons of light being absorbed and electrons jumping up and down energy levels very nicely. Uh, another one that's quite an interesting one to look at is this link here will take you through to a periodic table where you can actually select elements and look at the emission and absorption spectrum of those elements and see the unique emission and absorption spectrum, the fingerprint of each element. Um, the last one down here, the discharge lamp simulation. We'll see discharge lamps in the lab, but this lets you, again, visualise the process by which passing a current through a gas, so creating a potential difference, connecting a supply to a discharge lamp, passing a current of electrons through a gas, when those electrons can actually give energy to the atoms in the gas, and so we see the emission spectrum of the gas, we see it emitting its photons according to its um, line spectra. One last thing I thought it would be um, a shame not to mention while we're talking about emission absorption spectra is redshift as well. So if you have a look, here's an absorption spectrum of an element measured on Earth. And when we look at distant galaxies, if we pick out the absorption spectrum of particular elements, not only does it allow us to pick out the elements in other galaxies, in other stars, by reading these um, absorption spectra a bit like barcodes as unique ways of identifying the elements, but we also see something else. These barcodes get shifted Okay, and the further away through the universe we look, the further away a galaxy is, the more that shift has happened. And we've come to understand that this is evidence of the universe expanding, of space itself expanding. And so those waves getting stretched, those photons, their wavelength increasing as they travel through space until they reach us. And so we see them at a longer wavelength because they've been stretched out. So we see the shift towards the red end of the spectrum. So this is why we call it redshift.